with a roll, let's call up yonder.
So you hear echoes, do you? I hear echoes. That's the first stage of you know what. <laughs> I mean, it's not menopause. I mean, this, this is the first stage of, you know, you're joining us. You're coming aboard. What color is your hair? Ah. Maybe it's the dark. <laughs> Well, here we are at the barn. Think of all the regret of these people that occupy these empty chairs, how they're vacationing. And they're sitting around now saying, we, we, should, we shouldn't have left home. We should, we should have. We should, the, 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 the lake is too cold. It's, we should be here. But we've already forgiven them. And uh, we won't add that to their perfect attendance. Record, so. Like I said last week, it's kind of a transient outfit here. You know, we kind of come and go, and that's good. That's why I told Kevin, it's good to have these self-contained messages and teaching. So you can take it with you, and uh, when you come back in two weeks, you missed one. But uh, hey, you know, you got what you got. And that was enough for two weeks. Maybe that's what's going on here. Maybe your preaching is causing people to take vacations. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to take a vacation soon, aren't you? Yeah. Well, that's what you told me. Yeah. Okay. We have echoing, too. Echoing, yeah, echoing. Yeah, Nancy told me about that years ago. And I wasn't echoing yet, but it started up. It's part of the menu. Hey, I'm glad you're here. We're glad you're here. We've got people in the band here. Chris is gone, but Aaron is here. Chris won't be here for a couple more weeks. He's, where is Chris? He's going to Italy. He's going to Italy? So our, our outreach is international. <laughs> so we're glad, we're glad for that. And uh, a report from Joan. Joan, our wheelchair buddy, Joan and Adam. And uh, she's at Mary Freebed now. Mary Ellen visited her today. I called her today. She says, uh, pray that I'll find my glasses. Did she tell you that? She lost her glasses. I told her I, I lose mine with alarming regularity. I hardly could. I have four or five pair laying around, so I could if I lose them, I, you know. Anyhow, yeah, and she's wearing her own clothes. And she was pretty happy about that. Instead of the hospital gown, you were wearing a hospital gown? That's why I really want to stay away from hospitals. Those gowns are not very confining, as it were. But uh, it's all right. Yeah, glad you're, glad you're here. You've been good service. The singing's been, been good. But uh, JP just uh, told me this. Lupe, one of the guys that works up at the... Uh, up at the ranch where the cows are. Pray for Lupe. He just, that was today? Just now. Just now. Called JP. And he just found out his father was killed in a car accident. So, Father, we pray for Lupe. What a wonderful song it is that he hideth my soul in the cliff of the rock. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. He taketh my burden away. I pray that you'll somehow help Lupe to bear this burden. May he know that there are those who don't know him, but don't need to. We still pray for people who don't know, like the people in Afghanistan, people around the world that are suffering so many different ways. May they somehow come to know the Lord Jesus who taketh our burden away, far away, as far as the east is from the west. He taketh our burdens away. And so often we're prone to leave our heavy burdens at the cross. And then, then because we drift, we come back and pick them up. We need to leave them there. You're here tonight with burdens. You hear about the cross. You leave your heavy 
burdens at the cross. And who of us does not have burdens? And sometimes they're heavy, heavy burdens. Hard, very hard to bear. Thank you for being our burden bearer. Thank you for reminding us day unto day of your grace, your mercy, your kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Be all over Kevin tonight as he preaches and teaches to us. Thank you for those that are here. Thank you for those that aren't, but have been here. The fact that COVID brought us the barn, a gift none of us really asked for, but it came in spite of the disease. Amazing, surprising, the way you work, the way you bring us together. And so, Lord, we're, uh, we're grateful to you and pray that you will accept this service as, uh, as a gift from us to you. You don't need anything. And so we're not doing it to fulfill any of your needs. It's our need to worship. That's our need. And we, we love to have that need to worship you. And so we express that to you tonight and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We were surprised tonight by uh, the appearance of some missionary people extraordinaire that have been uh, all, over the, all over the world, Tim and Judy Heath. Glad to see you here tonight, Tim and Judy. Bless you and your continuing, your continuing work. Let's sing some more, okay? Let's do it.
Lord, you are always with us.
uh, chapter here uh, for this evening. And in honor of work and labor, uh, being Labor Day, we're going to look at that particular topic. And we're going to look at how we can answer that question. How can there be a, a, a directional change in my life, and how can that stay? Or what are, the, what are the things that are necessary, the tools that are here, in order for me to, to move in that direction and stay in that direction? There's always going to be some wavering. There's always going to be some ups and downs. Even in the life of Paul, we see that, and Peter and, and others. There, there, are, there are times when, when there are small adjustments that need to be made. It's always going to be there. We live in the flash. We have this flash. And so the flash is there, and it pulls, and it, and it, and it, and it, and it tries to direct us in the direction that it would have us go. The scriptures tell us how we can overcome that. It answers those questions, and that's what we're going to be looking at uh, here tonight. So let's pray, and we'll get down to work. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the texts that you have provided for this day. I thank you for both the struggle and the uh, elation of working through the ideas over the course of this last week in coming up with uh, these great truths that you have for us. I thank you for that and for the intimacy and the time that we have spent together over all of these things, talking through all of these ideas. I give you great, great thanks for your faithfulness your faithfulness to us, for your faithfulness to me. And as I pause and as I think about uh, what we're about to do, Father, we're about to open your word. I'm about to, uh, to proclaim some of the word, some of the word that's here, the truth that is found here. And I ask myself, who is, who is capable of such things? The words that we have are unable to describe. The words that, that have been invented uh, are unable uh, to even come close to describing who and what you are. You live in this unapproachable light, and yet you tell us to approach. We approach, we have nothing to say, and yet we burst forth with, 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 uh, with praise and with ideas. And, 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 and Father, so I pray that in the confusion, and in the, in the confusion of this, this beautiful, beautiful mess that we call your graves, I pray that you will lead us and direct us to yourself, that we in the course of this night, the course of this night, will see you a bit more Clearly, I thank you for the words that we're going to be reading from your book. I thank you for the, uh, the words that you are going to be giving me. And I pray that I will in no way hinder, that I will in no way get in the way of the truths that you want delivered. And I pray that you will use words that all of us are able to understand. Each of us has this ability in, our, in, in, in and of ourselves to understand certain things. And I pray that with the words that we understand, I saw a little kid walking into church this morning, eight-year-old, nine-year-old boy, had a whole, a whole Bible in his hand, a whole and New Testament. And I pray that you will use words that he is able to understand, so that perhaps in the course of his life, as he walks through this life, he will not hit this stage in life that he feels like he has to move to the left or to the right, as I did for so many, so many years. I pray that he will direct his little mind and his little heart toward you, and I pray that for everyone here tonight, that you will speak to us as only you can, and that we will not only hear those words, but we will have the courage to truly listen to what you have for us this night. We praise your name, Father. We can spend the rest of the night praying and praising your name for all the many things that you have done. We can look at them simply, we can look at them in depth, and Father, whatever I, it, 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 would, it would be overwhelming for us to do these things, and I pray that we will. I pray that we will do this often, that we will contemplate you, that we will meditate you in the speed and the pace in which everybody lives these days, that we will step out of that, that we will find our heel, and that we will sit quietly in your presence and listen to you speak to us. I thank you for the way in which you do that. I thank you for the way in which you wait for us to do that. Off running around doing all these important things, Father, and there you are waiting for us to come and sit on our hill and wait. So, Father, we give you thanks. But here tonight, as we open your word, as I teach, I pray, Father, that it will not fall on deaf ears, but that we will listen and that the, the, the prayers uh, and the lives of everyone in this room and everyone listening on on the table, we'll begin to heat up spiritually, Father. Uh, may we be tired, may we be tired of, of our prayers having grown cold to the touch. 
May we grow tired, Father, of, of living a life that, 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 that resembles all others. May we desire more than anything else to walk with you, to serve you, to, to work for you and with you. Thank you for the, the call that you have given to all of us as your children. And I pray that we will listen carefully to it, that we will design our lives so that we will have not only the time, but the desire to serve and walk with you. Bless us this night, Father. And what I mean by that is you will open the eyes of our hearts a little bit more so that we may see you more clearly. Bless us with a deeper and a stronger and a thicker sense of who you are and what you are about to do in our lives. And we ask all of this. All of it. The beautiful, powerful, powerful name. The gracious, gracious, the eternal, the eternally gracious name. Loving, caring, and gentle, and guiding, guiding names of our Lord and great Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our evening is going to begin in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. For those of you who have studied the Word of God, you realize what chapter this is. There are 58 verses in this chapter that is devoted uh, to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Apparently, there were those in the Corinthian church who had begun to question whether there uh, really was a resurrection. There were those in the Corinthian church that began to question the teaching of the Apostle Paul, who taught very clearly and explains very early on in this chapter that the, 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 the first thing he spoke to them, the first thing that he taught them when he came to them was that Jesus Christ had died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again from the dead on the third day, according to the scriptures. This was the first message that was proclaimed by the Apostle Paul, and that message was then, uh, 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 had then grown, not, not with other material or new material, but with material as what I call the great cross words, the great words of the cross. And he began to develop the themes that are found in those very early verses of this 15th chapter of, uh, of 1 Corinthians. And as he taught them, one of the great truths that, was, that he taught was that Jesus Christ rose from the dead on the third day according to the scriptures. And so he develops that theme, he develops that idea all the way through the 15th chapter of 1 uh, uh, of, of Corinthians. And so I'm going to read just a couple of verses that are there, because he develops it in many different ways. But I want to look at verses 12 to 19 here. I'm going to be reading out of the King James, and this is just a taste of where the apostle was going with this, uh, with this argument, or with this portion of 1 Corinthians. Listen to what it says. It says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found to be false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which have fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Now he goes on and talks further in many different directions regarding the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But ultimately what he's doing is he's bringing the Corinthian people back who had wandered away from the truth. They heard what it was. Christ died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. And they had wandered away from point three. They held on to one and two. But they had wandered away from, from, from point three. And Paul was writing this letter in order to bring them back to a sound understanding of what the gospel is. 
And his reason for doing that is because the, the it is going to be stated in the 58th verse of this chapter. He goes on to describing about how uh, uh, the resurrection was there. And because of the resurrection, there is no longer a sting with death. There is no longer victory with the grave. This, there used to be a sting in death, and there used to be victory with the grave, but it is no longer the case because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what Paul is doing is he's bringing this great topic, this great theme right down, and bringing it right down to verse 58, where it has it begins with a therefore. And whenever you come across the therefore in the scriptures, you need to go back and reread once again, the material that came prior to that, therefore, you are not going to understand what is about to be said until you go back and read and reread the material that has already been said. That's what the therefore means. As the result of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as the result of the fact that he lives and there is no sting in death, there is no victory in the grave, as the result of that, he says, my beloved brethren, verse 58, and this is the key right here. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I live in the Silver Lake area. There's a lot of noise going on there right now. Big weekend, all kinds of people up there. Kind of the last big flame. And I had to drive through town to pick up a buddy of mine in order to go to church this morning. And I was driving back listening to the engines as they began to roar. All kinds of activity was about to take place in that particular area on this particular weekend. Why? Because that's where everybody wanted to be. They wanted to be there and enjoy all of the things that were there. I, I told him on the way to church, and I mentioned it again at church, everything that we see, Everything that you see around you, all of the noise and all of this stuff is going to be gone by next week. The only thing that we have that is going to last is our work and our service for God. Everything else, all that we have accumulated, all that we have laid aside, everything that we think we own, everything that we think we have a handle on, all of these things are going to be gone by next week. And the only thing that is going to last the only thing that is going to count is the service and work and labor that we do for God in the life that he has given to us. Now what the Apostle Paul is trying to do here is to have the people realize, look, because of the resurrection, because there is going to be this beautiful life after this life, because of that, this becomes then the motivation for me to move and to serve my God. See, this is what I didn't understand for years and years. I would look back on my life and I would say, you know what? I would have done some poor things here. I really made some bad decisions over the last several months or years or whatever it has been. And so I said to myself, I'm no longer going to do that. I repent of these things and I'm going to walk in this particular direction. And it was only a matter of time before I was pulled right back into first my eyes and then my body twisted and then my feet twisted. And before I knew it, I was walking down the very same path that I had walked down. This verse right here, verse 58, is the answer to the question, how do we turn toward God? How do we serve him? How do we work for him? And have it last. The Apostle Paul is telling us in verse 15 right here, as a result of all of this stuff, what we have to look forward to, what God has done, by raising Christ from the dead and pulling us up with him. What God has done in his son and through his son, Jesus Christ, we will begin and be able to experience for an eternity. And this mind frame is what he wants the Corinthian church to have. And this mind frame is what we are to have. And when we have that mind frame right here, that is because of all that has been done for us, and we look at the verses that are there describing all that is going to take place, all that has taken place. Therefore, my beloved brethren, uh, be, be ye steadfast, unmovable, and always, always abounding in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. This becomes the motivation of our life. To be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, because we know that everything that we do with him, for him, and because of him, is not in vain. And everything else, everything else that we see, everything ultimately,
is in vain. We are not going to be able to bring this stuff. We have one thing and one thing only, and that is my relationship with God, the work that I do for him, the service that I, that I render unto him because of what he has done for me. So now, the last commitment that I made in a long time now, but the last commitment that I made was to study this portion of the Word of God and others that are like it. And this has become the motivation for me to turn away from the things that used to hold me. And now I'm walking in the way that God would have me walk. Now steadfast, unmovable, abounding in the work that, of, of, of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain, in the Lord. But now let's look at that technically a little bit. He mentions the word work basically twice. He talks about work and then he talks about labor. It's the same word. And it seems very important to me that we understand what he means by that. What he's talking about when he's talking about the, the work or labor for the Lord. Okay? So we don't go leave here and go running off randomly doing nice things. Now there's nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with doing randomly nice things. But there's, a, there's something that he means by this, okay? And that's what we're going to look into at, uh, uh, right now. That question, what is the work of God? What is the work that God requires of me? That question was asked of the Lord Jesus. You remember the great sixth chapter of, of, of John. In the beginning of the chapter, he feeds 25,000 people. You remember that? He takes just a handful of fish and a little bit of bread and, and, and separates it out and feeds 25,000 people and has all kinds of food left over. Okay? A wonderful, profound miracle. And the people that ate that food right there, they said, you know what? This would be a good king. Who, after all, just want a king that's going to feed us like this. And, and so they were going to forcefully make him their king. He slipped off. Went off by himself, spent time with the Father, okay? The next day, they found him. And there's an interesting question in the 29th verse of John chapter 6. So I want you to go there and look what this says. John chapter 6, verse, I'm going to start with verse 28. It says, then said they unto him, what shall we do? that we might work the works of God. What shall we do that we might work the works of God? In other words, what is the work that God requires of us? We want to know what that is. What is that work? They were thinking that there might be a task. There might be something that there, and they want to know what that, what that was. I find the answer of the Lord Jesus to be fascinating uh, in the least. Listen to what it says. Then Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he has sent. And that's the end of it. That's the answer right there. So what is the work that God requires of us? That we believe on the one whom he has sent. Now, just a, a brief pause here. Let's, let's look at that. Now, going back to that initial illustration that I talked about early on in my life, how I would make a commitment to God, and then after a period of time, that would fade away. And then I'd say, you know what, it's not going to work, it's not going to happen, I'm just going to go my own way, and, and hopefully I'll survive, okay? And so that was the trap, and then there would be another, and so it would be cyclical like this. Okay, that's exactly what happens to so many people because, because they believe in the way in which we believe in all kinds of other historical facts. In 1492, says the short poem, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Okay, and so I wasn't there, I, I didn't see it, but I've read about it. I've read accounts of that that say that in 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Blue said he landed in a certain place, and that was the discovery of all these great things. Okay, so so we look on that and we say, you know what? I believe that Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue. I I, I, I I believe that. And there are many many people that are occupying pew space in all of our churches today that believe that Jesus Christ came to this. They don't understand who he is. They don't know exactly. They don't know anything. Either. They don't read the book very much. But they they understand that Jesus Christ came. That he lived this perfect life. Many of you, many people believe that he that he died a martyr, that he that he died for his cause, 
Some people think that he was a lunatic. Some people think that he was old. But, but, but they understand that he lived, okay? That he died on the cross, that he was buried, and even though they don't understand it, he rose again from the grave. And so they see those facts. They understand those facts, and they believe those things. And they believe themselves to be tight with God, even though those facts don't move me to read, they don't move me to study, they don't move me to worship, they don't move me to praise. They simply are facts in my head. And that's the case for many, many people in the church today. And so I'm going to look at, and I think it's very important for us to understand what this word believe means. Because when the Lord Jesus says, this is the work, one work, this is the work that God requires of you, that you believe in the one whom he has sent. What does it mean to believe? To believe like that, where we are actually doing the work of God. Well, I want you to take your Bibles and I want you to go to the book of Matthew. We're going to go to Matthew 16, and we're going to be there for a little bit. The 16th chapter of Matthew. We're going to be looking at just a couple of verses, 24, 25, and 26. Matthew 16, 24, 25, and 26. Listen to what he says. He says, if any man, and, and that word man, by the way, in the, in the authorized version, uh, that man is italicized, okay, which means that it's not there. It's okay. They put in the word for clarity. That's all they did. But the word man is not there. He's simply saying, okay, if any will come after him. That's what he, that's what he means, okay? He's talking to men and he's talking to women here, okay? Listen to what he said. If any will come after him, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now that first phrase right there, if any will come after me, that's the idea of what he means back over there in the John 6 passage, okay? To believe in the one who is sent. I want to I want to believe. I want to believe in that way, okay? That means that I want to move after him. That's exactly what verse 24 means here. If any will say that I want to believe, if any will come after me, these are the requirements, and there's three of them. Listen to what it says. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. What in the world does that mean? And I believe it's vital that we understand what that means, because that is the definition of belief, John 6, 29. That is the definition of belief. What does it mean to deny one's self? To deny oneself. The world, as we know, and I've mentioned this before, there are five, five principles that the world works by, okay? The first one is force. The second one is greed. The third one is selfishness. The fourth one is ambition. And the fifth one is pleasure. These are the principles in the world in which we live. What God is talking about here, that the Lord Jesus is making clear in verse 24, when it says that let a man deny himself. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. This means that we are going to look at the principles of this world. We're going to look at all that the world stands for. The force, greed, selfishness, ambition, and pleasure. And we are going to deny ourselves these things. We are going to walk away from these things, from the pattern of this world. He talks about it in Romans 12. You know what it says. I urge you, brethren, he says, in view of the mercy of God, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing unto him. This is your reasonable act of worship. And do not conform any longer to the force, to the selfishness, to the ambition, to the, to the greed that is, that is there as the pattern of this world. So what the Lord Jesus means right here, it's exactly what he means right there. If any will come after me, he will deny himself. If you wanted to see what it means a little more clearly, go to verse 25. And then we're going to come back to verse 24 in a minute. Listen to what he said. If any man will come after me, I'm sorry, verse 25. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Ever wonder what that means? For whoever will save his life will lose it. And whoever will lose his life 
for my sake, we'll fight. Let me explain what that means. If we, if we save our lives in a worldly sense, in other words, I give into it, because the flesh, the world, and the devil are always pulling me in the direction of this world. And if I give into that and say, you know what, I'm simply going to live this way. I've come to church once on Sunday, but I'm going to live my life this way. And so we live our lives according to the pattern of this world. That's exactly what that means. And so what it, what it means to, to save our lives where the world looks at us. And they say, look at the way in which he has followed the pattern of this world. And they rejoice and they embrace and they welcome us into the fold when we, when we decide to live after the pattern of this world. But when, when we decide to save our lives in a worldly sense, we will lose our lives in a spiritual sense. When we, when we lose our lives in a worldly sense, we save our lives, according to the Lord Jesus, in a spiritual sense. So the first requirement in believing, the first requirement in doing the work of God is to deny ourselves. It doesn't mean that we fast every day of our lives. It doesn't mean that we reject the beautiful things that are in this world. It doesn't mean that we don't look at flowers anymore or pick up babies or anything else like that. There are many, many beautiful things around us that, that surround us in the world in which we live. God has created a beautiful place. It is a wonderful place for us to be and we can enjoy all of these beautiful relationships and laughter and, and all, of this, all of this stuff. When Jesus says he will deny himself, exactly what he means is that we will say no to the pattern of this world of force, greed, selfishness, ambition, and pleasure. If one will come after me, he will deny himself. Point two, he will take up his cross. He will take up the cross. What does that mean? Well, for many it means that they would they, they, they take up the, the willingness to give their life or, or, or something like that. And so it becomes kind of a symbolic thing that I have or they wear one around their neck or some people even pick them up and carry them across the country. I've heard all of these different stories, but what does it mean here? To take up our cross and follow him. I'm convinced that it means that we become knowledgeable in the great words of the cross. When you begin to study, when you begin to study to show yourself approved, says, says Paul in St. Timothy, but when you do that, you begin to study what these words are, the depth of each one of them, how they are all interconnected, how they work together, how they are all beautifully intersected with each other. When we study these great, great words of the cross, we take up a knowledge of, and not just a head knowledge, but a knowledge that is deep and it's wide and it's thick and it motivates me to do the things that God has called me to do. We have an understanding of the great, great words of the cross. And so number one, we deny ourselves. I say no to force, greed, selfishness, ambition, and pleasure. I say, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm tired of living my life this way, anxious about all of this stuff, worried about the way in which thieves might break in and steal or rust is going to destroy these things. I'm tired of that. I'm done with these things. I am going to set aside the pattern of this world, and I am going to deny myself these things. I'm going to take up the cross. I'm going to take up the great words of the cross. I'm going to study them. I'm going to know them not in some cold theological way, but in the way in which they have been presented to us in the book, where we see and we know all that God poured into these great, great words of the cross. I will take up my cross, and I will follow him. Combine all these three words together, and what we become is exactly what the Lord Jesus called us to be in Acts chapter 1. You remember verse 8? Remember what he told the disciples? That you will be my what? Witnesses. That you will be my witnesses. Now at first it's going to start right here in Jerusalem. Okay? It's going to start small. And then after a while it's going to, it's going to broaden and it's going to include Judea and Samaria. It's going to include this little larger region there. And then it's going to include what? The uttermost ends of the earth. But we are the witnesses of Christ. We are his witnesses. You know what the Greek word is for that? Artus. Artus. You know what that means? Martyr. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah, not a martyr. A martyr is one who dies. A martyr is one who, who, who dies for his faith. Not a witness. A witness just died. But, but, but 
The same word, but he says, you are my witnesses. What he is telling them and what he is telling us through them is that you are to know and understand and believe these things to the point where, to the point where your life is taken from you as the result of your faith and your trust in me, give it away. It's exactly what the Apostle Paul meant. In, in, in the 20th chapter, it's my favorite all-time all -time chapter in the entire Word of God. Listen to what this says. Listen to what he says. The Apostle says in verse 24, this is really small print. I need these. In verse 24, listen to what he says. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Now that was said in response to verses 22 and 23. Listen to what he says. And now he says, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I don't know what's going to happen to me when I get to Jerusalem. There have been people that have told me that there would be a lot of trouble if I, go to, if I go to Jerusalem. But listen to what he says. Uh, 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 in verse, in verse uh, 22, I, 23, I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. Prison and hardships are facing me. And then what he says, however, no matter what's facing me, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the task, finish the race that the Lord Jesus has given me the task of, of, of preaching the gospel of the grace of of God. That's exactly where God wants us to be. And when we study and when we understand, especially chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians where we began, when we study these things and understand these things, less and less important will be the things of my life. Not those who are in it. I'm always going to love those who are near me. Don't, don't misunderstand God. He's not telling us to throw everything away. Those who love us and those who are we're not telling us to do that. But that in our thinking, the way in which we think, way in which we think. I am every, every day, less and less, I am worth uh, in my own eyes. If only I may do the work that God has called me to do, to be a witness for him, to be a martyr for him in this life. With the words that he preached and with the life that he lived, with all of the things that he did and with all of the things that we are to do as members of the body of Christ. This is our witness to those who are around us. Yeah, but Kelly, I don't know those words. I don't know how to get to know them. Get to know them. Know the words. How can you claim to be in Christ if you don't even know what the words mean? You don't even understand what they mean. Some sort of a, a, a belief that you had way back when about um, did, but you don't understand what justification is. You don't understand sanctification. You don't understand redemption. You don't understand these words. Understand what they are. So that when you communicate, either with your mouth or with your life, you're communicating the great truths that are found in the Word of God. And this is the work that we are called to do in verse 58 of 1 Corinthians 15. Be steadfast. Steadfast in the truth. Unmovable in the great truths that are found in the word of God. And always superabounding. You are abounding in the work that God has given us to do. And when we do that, when we do that, when we are engaged in, and when we are active, in doing the things that God has called us to do, amazing things begin to happen on the inside. He tells Philemon in verse 6, that small little letter right before Hebrews, he says, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith. I pray that you may be active in being a witness for me. I pray that you may be active in doing that so that you, Philemon, will have a fuller and a deeper understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. I remember the first time that verse hit me. I wasn't even going to be preaching on that on that particular verse. I went to a church. I was invited to a church. I met in a, in a mini mall. In a, in a mini mall. It was a church plant. And, and, and I went there and 
I saw all kinds of instruments and all the stuff up on the stage. And as people were coming in, I was greeting them, saying, hey, how you doing? And I'm looking at their hands, just before phones, we couldn't even blame it on the phone. And, 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 and no one had the book. No one had the book with them. No one carrying the Bible. So I, I, go, to the, I go to the restroom, and I, and I shut the doors, and, I, and I'm in there, and I'm like, what, what, what's wrong with people? What is wrong with people? Why won't they take your book? Why don't they pick it up? Why don't they have a desire to learn the things that are found in here? And it occurred to me right there as I was, and I was thinking about Philemon verse 6. And I began speaking on that just a few minutes later in the church service. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you can, in sharing your faith, either in word or in the things that you do, that you might have a fuller understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. And it's absolutely true. Every time I stand up and preach, every time, there is something that I learn, either in the preparation process or in the delivery process. There's something I learn. And I have a deeper and stronger understanding of God as a result of sharing the faith that God has given me to share. Amen. To know these things. To be a witness. To be a witness slash martyr for Jesus Christ. Willing, able, to lay down my life, to lay down our lives for the things that God has called us to do. There's people in other parts of the world that are in the process of doing that right now. They may not have the choice of whether they want to do it or not, but it really doesn't matter. Because they've made the stand, they've, they've made their position known that we are witnesses for Jesus Christ. Their lives will be taken from them. It will be taken. If they haven't already, their lives are going to be taken, taken from them. But God will usher them into his presence. God will take them home. God will take them home. And they will not die one moment before God has designed them to die. And there will be no sting. Okay? There will be no victory. There will be no victory in the grave or in, the, or, or, or in their death. The only victory is theirs when they go home to be. And this is what we are called to do. So when we look at the great words of the cross, when we look at those great, great truths that are found in the word of God, these are the things that motivate me to do what God has called me to do. So that when I stand steadfast now, it's not a matter of what direction things are going. It's not a matter of what might come into my life, what not come into my life. It is a matter of following the, the word of God. And I am steadfast, unmovable, unmovable, and abounding in the work that God has called us to do. Why? Why? Because our labor in the Lord is not in vain. It's not in vain. Everything else around you is vain. Everything you see, everything around us is going to be gone. But our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Deny yourself. The way we are told to do it in the word of God tonight. Take up the great cross, the great words of the cross, and begin following him. And that decision, that commitment, that recommitment that you've made for the 17th time in your 30 years, that recommitment will now be real in the eyes of God and the eyes of men. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for these verses that we will look at here tonight. What a joy it is to talk about these things, and I pray, Father, that all of us here, all of us, that we will take hold, we will take hold, that we will stand steadfast, unmovable in the great teachings of your word, Father, and, and unmoved in you, and that we will super abound, super abound in the work that you have given us to do. What a joy it is to do that work, what a joy it is to be able to be called to do that by you yourself. So, Father, I pray for all of us here, that all of us will abound in the labor that you have given to us, knowing, knowing that our work in the Lord is not in vain. In Jesus' name we pray.
Good evening, everyone. My name is Evangelist Linda Kennedy. And um, the Lord has gifted me, he gives me songs um, to share with the body of Christ. And this song uh, goes right along with Pastor's teaching tonight. So just open up your hearts and let this be your prayer. Lord, I know I must spend time with you, time alone in your presence, cause it's a new because we care. <laughs> Family of God. So, we leave here and we put the, we put the truth ahead of us and there's shoes on that truth and we're wearing them because God in his unlimited creative ability his unlimited redemption, his unlimitedness as God himself. Has That's why he gave us the Bible, because he has chosen to share the to share the work. He has limited himself. Can you imagine that? To uh, to you and to I, to be 
his hands in this in this world. And it's a it's a dangerous place out there. It really is. But that's where the that's where the joy is, isn't it? Let's remember Loopy. Does he have a family? JP? Yeah. Probably has a mom now who's widowed. Maybe brothers and sisters. Yeah, we don't know him. But God does. God, God can take care of him. Wonderful Savior is Jesus our Lord. He taketh my burden away. It's good that we can leave our, our burdens with, with him. He knows, how to, he knows how to handle them. He knows how to handle each of us. So, Father, thank you for gathering us together once again. Thankful for this, uh, this work and your work throughout the world. And we pray that uh, leaders of countries will be touched by your word. The Lord Jesus is all, is all over the place. His spirit is out there. But there are other spirits that work against his. That we know one day the victory, the victory will be his and ours. It's already been won. Just a case of waiting for that, for that day. So may we be good at that. May we be good at waiting on you as you work through us for the glory of your Son. So we bless you. Thank you for tonight. And gather us again, once again, next week. For Jesus' sake. Amen. And, and thank you for your generosity. You guys have been stopping by that Folgers camp with alarming regularity. And that's a good thing. It's, uh, it's paying off.